Dionysis Capsalis. Dionysis Capsalis. Dionysis Capsalis is one of Greece's foremost poets. He was born in 1952 in Athens. He studied classical philology and English literature. Dionysis Capsalis lives in Athens, Greece. Athena Papadakim studied political science, but she works as a journalist and a poet. She is a very interesting voice of Greek literature in her serialistic uh, poems. She writes about ordinary life, and she also talks about religious matters. She lives and writes in Athens. Zilfilivanelli is a composer, very famous composer, writer, also director. He is an extremely important personality in the Turkish cultural life. During the coup d'etat, he was imprisoned, and then in 1984, after years in exile, he returned to Turkey. Tomasz Lanie is a diplomat, a, an interpreter, a translator. Um, he was born in 1944 here in Prague. During his studies at Charles University, he focused on Russian and Turkish philology, and he has devoted most of his time to these two languages and to these cultures. He has worked also in the Middle East, and. Um, each and every of his foreign missions has been a contribution not only to his translator's work, but also to the Czech reader. <coughs> Conversations on the theme, those Greeks were superficial out of profundity. This conversation is uh, moderated by Konstantin Kokosis, who studied law at the University of Athens. Then he pursued his studies in Brussels, where he studied foreign affairs. Kokosis is a very um, careful observer who, against historical background, follows the fates of the heroes of the characters of his novels. At the moment, he is ambassador to the Czech Republic. Uh, good evening, Hello. all of you for assisting this panel. Uh, we are faced uh, with a rather provoking, I would say, <laughs> ambivalent saying uh, um, attributed to, to Nietzsche. Uh, those Greeks uh, were superficial out of profundity. And um, in order to pave the way to, to the discussion and to your contributions, uh, I can handpick some elements with your permission. Uh, let's take, first of all, the word profundity. Uh, maybe I would uh, like to listen from you if there is, according to, you, to yourselves, uh, any indication uh, to the difference between, for instance, uh, the visible and the invisible, something uh, that, however, in both cases is felt or experienced in uh, the Greek behavior, or uh, according to, to, to Nietzsche, what do you think, how, how the surrounding world appears under the day, today sometimes harsh circumstances for the Greece, from the Greeks? And uh, if you would like uh, to limit ourselves uh, to the literature, so, do you think that uh, do poets, for instance, more precisely the Greek poets, uh, Mr. Kapsalis, Kap Mrs. Papadaki, can provide, for instance, answers to very practical questions, uh, uh, even by way of silence, for instance? Or poets, uh, according to the Greek uh, uh, Nobel Prize laureate uh, Seferis, are void or may be useful for only university use only, as Mr. Kapsalis uh, writes somewhere, poetry, on poetry. 
for instance, we nowadays we are wit witnessing in Greece demonstrations, uh, social reactions, uh, a, a general uh, unrest. Is uh, there any superficial way, you think, uh, to offer answers or to attempt to explain? Do you think really the Greeks uh, uh, behave uh, like that out of the profundity, according to Nietzsche, or they do so looking, for instance, uh, for something else, uh, looking into, say, for uh, the quintessence of the things? Uh, if I may just uh, go a bit back, for instance, sixth century before Christ, the Greeks, uh, starting from the real, from their real philosophical nest, uh, that is Asia Minor, have trying to explain things with a more, so to say, uh, dialectic approach. We, you, we have analysis, we, ha we have uh, uh, juxtaposition, synthesis, or composition. There has been a constant, how to say, effort to profit uh, from uh, belonging or res uh, residing in bo on both sides. That is the East, and here we have uh, Mr. Jerfri uh, Livaneli from Turkey, or from the West, and we have uh, here Mr. Thomas Lanya from the Czech Republic. How much uh, we think uh, we can think about converging on, or if you prefer this, uh, competing antagonistic uh, tendencies we are faced here? Can someone speak uh, of an intermingling civilization, or it is a constant, a single one, with a kind uh, of uh, m motion, mo moving upwards? W w what's your feeling? And uh, for instance, if uh, we go back to this uh, very ancient philosophers, for instance, you can have a Heraclitus saying, you cannot step to I into the same river. Or oh, the foundation of the world uh, is at rest, and the world is in itself in motion. How much uh, you think uh, this is simple? How much it appears or it is naive? Uh, are we really, we Greeks, uh, uh, even in our days, superficial, you think? Uh, and uh, all Greeks uh, have always been trying to, to struggle with uh, the perennial words in order to explain the world around them, around us. Uh, I think I have to stop here. Uh, I want not to monopolize, just uh, to frame the discussion. And uh, with uh, your permission, allow me to, to give uh, the micro, so to say, to the only lady among us, <laughs> Mrs. Papadaki. So, Mrs. Papadaki, the floor Christo. is yours. Christo. Ε, εμένα με ενδιαφέρει πάρα πολύ που αυτό που του Νίτσε, που είναι πολύ αιρετικό. Μιλάω ελληνικά, μ' ακούτε και θα κάνετε τη μετάφραση. Μ? Να το ξαναπώ πάλι. <laughs> Ότι είναι μια αιρετική άποψη του Νίτσε και με ενδιαφέρει πάρα πολύ. Mm -hmm. oh, uh, you can speak in English now. Oh, <laughs> right. Αυτό δεν είπαμε. Yes. Ποιος θα κάνει τη μετάφραση, εσύ ή ο κύριος Κώστας. Yes. <laughs> Okay, I understand, but it's difficult to speak. Right. I'll try to work as an interpreter. All oh, right. Okay. I just want to like say that this is a very um, theoretical idea of, of Nietzsche. Uh, Go ahead. Ne, ke ipo kiriós kokosis oti bori na ne naif afto tu irakli tu oti de boris na bis dio fores to idio potami ala afto ine nas nomos kosmikos ine iroi tu kosmo ena afto. Um, is that what um, Heraclitus said about not being able to enter the same river twice uh, is a kind of um, universal law. So it, it cannot possibly be considered uh, naive. I wanted to the three reasons uh, Ms. Papadaki thinks the Greeks um, went deep enough to touch uh, what we might call uh, uh, the essence of humanity, the human essence. Um, 
Το πρώτο είναι η δημοκρατία. Democracy. Που δέχεσαι τον άλλον και σέβεσαι αυτό που ψηφίζουν οι περισσότεροι. Αυτό είναι ένα σεβασμός προς τον άλλον και ένα σεβασμός που αυτό θέλουν οι περισσότεροι. Ένα είναι η δημοκρατία με αυτή την έννοια. So democracy is the first idea, which means respect shown to the other and respect for what the majority decide. Το δεύτερο είναι μια έννοια, η έννοια της ύβρεως. Ε, σημαίνει ότι δεν μπορείς να υπερβείς τα μέτρα και ότι πέρα από όταν υπερβείς τα μέτρα θα τιμωρηθείς. Second idea is the idea of hubris, uh, which is variously translated as tragic flaw, when it is in tragedy, uh, or um, it's a kind of a, a trespassing of, of uh, divine law. And what, what that means in, in Greek, ancient Greek culture, of course, is that you cannot uh, a trans a trespass uh, your measure or your limit uh, if you do, uh, you will be punished. That's another uh, indirect quotation uh, from Heraclitus, I think. Και ότι ούτε ο ήλιος δεν μπορεί να υπερβεί τα μέτρα. Είναι μια ρίση που λέει ότι ούτε ο ήλιος δεν μπορεί να υπερβεί τα μέτρα. Αυτό συνδέει τον άνθρωπο κατευθείαν με το σύμπαν. Αυτό έχει μια σχέση, η ανθρώπινη ουσία με το σύμπαν. Ότι υπάρχουν όρια και όρια, η σύνδεσή του με το σύμπαν. So this, this is a... Uh, an idea that uh, connects um, the universe or universal law with human essence. That neither the universe, because Heraclitus talks about the sun uh, not being able to uh, overstep his measure or his limit. Uh, so it's an idea that connects the universe, universal law, with human essence. Και το τρίτο είναι η τραγωδία και η κομμωδία ταυτόχρονα που δείχνουν τη δυσκολία την ανθρώπινη να καταλάβει κάποια πράγματα, να υποστεί τη μοίρα της και καταδεικνύει δηλαδή το... πώς είναι η λέξη... Το unpredictable. Mm? Unpredictable. unpredictable. Mm. Αυτό έχει μεγάλη σημασία στην τραγωδία. Αυτό που δεν περιμένεις, ξαφνικά γίνεται. So the... The third pillar, the basic idea is, comes from, from tragedy, uh, which of course deals with what we, we cannot escape, that is what we call uh, fate uh, in, in human life, and also what is unpredictable in human life, what, what comes at you, uh, catches up with you, and uh, perhaps kills you. Okay, then you can't predict and suddenly Κάτι σου τυχαίνει. Αυτά είναι καταρχάς αυτά που πιστεύω ότι δείχνουν ότι, ότι οι αρχαίοι Ελλήνες ψάξαν σε βάθος την ανθρώπινη φύση. Σε αυτά τα τρία θα σταθώ και μετά μπορούμε να μιλήσουμε. Ευχαριστώ. Also, three, three counts. Uh, Ms. Papadaki believes that the Greeks delved deep into human nature. Thank you very much. Thank you also the translation. Ευχαριστώ πολύ. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Kapsalis, if I may now turn it. To, Maybe to find me a job with the, with the embassy as interpreter. <laughs> right. <laughs> 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 Mr. To Mr. Thomas Lange. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, reading these um, Fischerovas checkpoints uh, uh, versus uh, returning from Greece, uh, there is uh, uh, an implication or there is a hint uh, that uh, this metaphysical language, is, as it is or as it appears, this. Uh, uh, saying by Nietzsche, uh, speaks about uh, uh, what uh, uh, the gods uh, uh, speak, the language of the gods, uh, according to Fischerova, uh, and the language of uh, the human beings uh, as a kind of truth, the truth which is inserted in the human being's language. Do you really think uh, that uh, there is always uh, this uh, how to say, visibly, an invisible thing between uh, Greek uh, godness uh, and, on the other hand, uh, the, uh, the behaving of uh, the human beings, I mean, the behavior of the human beings uh, in our days, Greece? Well, as not being 
as uh, ever of uh, uh, the uh, Greek uh, contemporaneous uh, situation, I can only judge from my overall uh, experience from the Middle East as uh, uh, seen uh, from Turkey. Uh, mm -hmm. Because I have spent a long time in Turkey, a long time just on the Turkish Greek uh, bound in the Turkish Greek boundary region, uh, seeing a lot, uh, having seen a lot of uh, uh, Greek uh, memories, Greek uh, architectural monuments in Turkey. So, uh, from that point of view, I can say that really, it is a lot of invisible in the in the relations between God and the man and that uh, it is something what uh, let led Greeks to uh, uh, to establish the uh, civilization of faith and what uh, uh, led the Gre Gre Greeks to accept uh, the Christianity as the as the face in one God and as the fa as the faith in something invisible and inexplicable and that the Greeks then spread this face in one God to the rest of the uh, of the European world and at the same time I think that Greece uh, brought um, um, made a uh, there was a uh, very uh, very happy uh, very happy uh, mutual uh, mutual relation between Greeks whose uh, uh, center was in Asia, Asia Minor in Istanbul and with the Turks who came from the East and that from this from from this relation this relation which was mutually very very uh, successful and uh, very useful uh, a, uh, something like uh, Mediterranean uh, nature of of the men has has sprang uh, sprang off. Uh, I can say that uh, the Eastern Christianity and the Turkish Islam uh, just uh, uh, affected by the uh, by by the mystical philosophy of so-called Tervishes in the middle in in the Middle Asia, Central Asia, coming from is something what uh, uh, created the modern Turkey, the, 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 the Turkish, Turkish way of life, Turkish, Turkish view of, of, the, of, of the existence, of a Turkish view of, uh, of the nature. And afterwards, it led to something what uh, created uh, the modern uh, civilization of the Mediterranean. So this is something what got together the, the Greece and Turkey and uh, we, were, we, 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 we could, we could uh, see, we, we could witness how uh, useful it was for both of the nations, for Greeks and, and Turks. Mr. Levan Ali, I'm turning to you as you can understand, having heard all that about your country. Tell me something. Reading, for instance, among other uh, Turkish writers, uh, uh, someone I very much like, for instance, Jamal Sureyadis, flowing yeah. yeah. voice, a man who watches life, uh, but in a very simple, not simplistic, very simple, and at the same time, very complex yeah. way, and complicating way, I would argue. So, you see that uh, this uh, superficiality, so to say, is uh, it in common with what uh, uh, 
for instance, Mr. Nietzsche could imply by saying uh, that there they were rather superficial yes, uh, and all that because of their profundity <laughs> or uh, since there was a lot of uh, mm. interrelation between uh, the Greek way of thinking and uh, mm. Asia Minor, Turkey's way of thinking. What do you think about that? Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, we are three Greeks and one Turk and one Czech on the stage now. I'm the least the objective one for Greece because I love Greece maybe more than you. <laughs> 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 so that's why uh, I think the Greek culture, ancient Greek culture and contemporary Greek culture is very profound and very, at the same time, very artistic. But so I've been thinking about this sentence, w what Nietzsche meant. And um, uh, I think he tried to answer his own dilemma because he's known as one of the biggest philosopher in the world. Of course he is, but for me, he's a poet. And he thought about himself and he defi defined himself as a poet. And uh, he liked to hear that kind of, you know, uh, uh, title, a poet. And when you read Zarathustra and other books, God is dead and others, this is really very intellectual, high-level provocations, using words like weapons. So that's why I think his philosophical discipline and his poetical side is ki uh, kind of re uh, have been resumed in this uh, sentence for Greeks. I mean, to be an artist is means to be a little bit superficial, and to be scientist or philosopher to be profound. But this is not the case. I mean, the, because the real poetry, as we all know, is not the good, nice words, but the big thoughts. I mean, philosophy. And um, uh, I uh, want to speak about what um, uh, Professor Thomas Schlan has said, but maybe in the second tour, let me continue my, my uh, thoughts about this. Um, uh, the famous Greek writer uh, Kazantzakis, in his autobiography, Letter to El Greco, he said something very important, and I feel it, because my summer house is in Bodrum, in Halikarnassos, and I travel a lot between Greek and Turkish islands, and then that. Uh, he says that the light is uh, sacred in uh, El Elara, and it is erotic in uh, uh, Asia, in Micro-Asia, which is true. And uh, it's very strange, but you feel it. I mean, I don't know the explanation, I don't know the answer, but I think we, now the, our contemporary problems, we can find almost every answer in Greek mythology. Every day when I face the problems in Turkey, or in the world, what is going on, uh, what they do for, for watching for the news coverage, I always refer every day to some examples of Greek mythology. I say, oh, again, Sisyphos. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is Endymion. <laughs> oh, this is something like this. This is, I think, humanity, basic of humanity. But maybe I'm trying to uh, dig the Nietzsche's thought, which, I, of course, I cannot say the answer. I'm not at that level this genius level, but maybe uh, he mentioned uh, about the Greek artistry is a little bit exaggerated. If you compare the Greek uh, uh, monuments, Greek uh, sculptures, uh, and if you compare this Greek sculpture with the uh, uh, micro-Asian sculpture, for instance, Hittite, or Mesopotamian, Sumer, or Egypt, I mean, you see that in Greek culture, it, the human being, is human body, is idealized. I mean, because in Hittite uh, paintings, you see it's, uh, there is no idealization. There is no exaggeration of human power or beauty. But maybe this could be uh, his, uh, one of his uh, arguments. And also another point, I write books, I write essays, and I write melodies. And this is my fourth year in music. I can say 
when I write so-called profound, for in my level, profound articles, profound essays, analysis, and talks, it is really difficult to uh, get the people, to reach the people through this. But my melodies, somehow, it works. It explains better and goes under the skin, you know, to the millions of people. And then, so then I uh, thought, then I express myself in better way with music, without words, even sometimes with instrumental music. So art, to be artist is on the surface maybe, if you compare with science and the, uh, and the uh, philosophy, but at the same time it is very uh, deep and very, uh, it goes deeper and deeper. And I will conclude this, there was a, uh, the famous uh, gathering of the uh, Hellenistic uh, philosophers and the uh, Micro-Asian philosophers in the island of Samos, you know, in the antiquity, to discuss with the relations between arts and sciences. And as we know that the result, or the result was, there is a very strong relation between them. And this famous saying of this mathematics is a silent music appeared from there. And I very much believe that there is a very strong relation, art history and science and philosophy, which means superficial and profundity. <laughs> Thank you so much. <coughs> Mr. Kapsalis, with all due respect uh, to previous speakers, I have to say that uh, they were very much diplomatic, but I have to become a bit more challenging and more provocative. <laughs> and you are my last uh, target because to make the discussion no. a bit... Second tour, just, just, oh. just open it. <laughs> Wait for the second tour. <laughs> the second tour, huh? Yes. A bit more of it. Yes. So uh, I will... Addressing a <coughs> very modern poet, uh, Greek poet, I will be very, very provocative. So, number one, uh, can someone say that the Greeks owe their survival as a race, as an identity, or maybe as a language to poetry? To what? To? Uh, they, they owe their survival mm. to poetry, and to what extent? Number two, how can a modern poet, for instance, like you, like Mrs. Papazaki, can address the people's concern, because the people demonstrate things, the people react, revolt maybe. So, and if this is so, if there is a revolt, a demonstration and a reaction, is like what you said in one of your essays, like the wall and the wallpaper, because you used one a very, mus very famous uh, wording from uh, Thomas Eliot, is that a pretext uh, for avoiding things, uh, or they want to get uh, deep into the quintessence of, of the real today's problem? And uh, do Greeks behave uh, in uh, a naive way, or they are negligent as uh, they are doomed to, to be labeled like that uh, in our days? how a poet could assess this behavior. How much uh, uh, enfant gâté, to say so, the Greeks uh, seems to be. Are they superficials? Not where, as Nietzsche did, but uh, actually today, are they superficial? Or they do so because uh, they look into the quintessence of the things. So please. Ah, oh, that's too many questions. Uh, well, let's start with the, with the poetry. Uh, it's not the easiest, but we can get it out of the way uh, and come back to it later. Um, in my view, when you write poetry, you just try to write a good poem, whatever that means. Uh, the rest is not our business. I'm sorry I have to answer in such a way, but that, that's the only thing I can say. Uh, if you start... Uh, dealing with the rest all the time, you start being a poet. Uh, you become a PR man. That's a different business altogether. So the rest is not our business. That's also from T.S. Eliot. Um, if I can get back to Nietzsche, because I think it's important. Now, first, as you mentioned, of course, Nietzsche is not talking about modern Greeks. He's talking about ancient Greeks, which are something else. 
uh, I don't think ancient Greece uh, is an exclusively modern Greek capital. Uh, it's a universal capital and anyone can bank on it. Uh, so I would like to take any notion or idea of nationalism away from ancient Greece, which is cultural capital for uh, all human beings, if they want to use it. Uh, I think what Nietzsche meant in that um, in a provocative statement, uh, trying to find out what Nietzsche meant is always very dangerous business, uh, because he was a great writer, as uh, Mr. Livanella said, and as a writer, he changed his opinions, and he wrote beautifully, and from book to book, he developed his ideas further. So it's very, and of course, because he wrote in that uh, aphoristic style, it's always very difficult to uh, speak discursively on what Nietzsche meant or meant to say. But I think in this quotation, his m basic problem uh, was what he had to do. And as a philosopher, he had to become extremely self-conscious uh, as a critical philosopher, uh, as, a, as, a, as a critic of society, culture, and philosophy. He had to become, uh, develop a very high reflective, highly reflective awareness of things and become very self-conscious. And it was precisely these ideas that he thought the Greeks had done without, without extreme self-consciousness. So in, in a sense, what he's saying uh, is that is something that uh, Dostoevsky had already said, that consciousness is a disease. And or self-consciousness is a disease, and it's a specifically modern disease, uh, which he knows he cannot uh, do without. He knows that he suffers from that disease, but he finds uh, in, in the charm of, of the ancient Greeks, and specifically probably he means the pre-Socratics, he, he finds them devoid of this kind of self-consciousness. That for Nietzsche meant to some extent that if they are lacking, the ancient Greeks, in this kind of self-consciousness, they're also lacking they lack our capacity for self-deceit, uh, for Kant and uh, hypocrisy. So that, I think, was behind, that, in my view, uh, behind what, what Nietzsche is saying in that specific uh, quotation, which comes from, I did my homework, comes from um, the, uh, his preface to the gay science, I think. Uh, now, there are many roads we can take from that, uh, some of them do lead to poetry and art, and I think Mr. Livanelli was absolutely right about one thing. I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. Now, one idea, of course, has to do, as I said, with, with self-consciousness and what that means. And, of course, we know uh, that uh, modernity is uh, the age of self-consciousness. We, we cannot get away from that. Uh, but the idea of... Um, or the utopia, which you talked about yesterday, of finding um, a new kind of uh, naivete through self-consciousness is not an idea that's altogether uh, unknown to, uh, you know, to artists. So in a sense, what many artists in the 20th century are trying to do is to get back to a kind of unself-consciousness, getting, getting rid of too much self through the self. Uh, it's not a strange idea, but that, I think that's what Nietzsche is saying because in, at the end of that quotation, he says the Greeks were artists, and this is what we're trying to do. We should look at the, the tones, the words, uh, the very skin of life, the surface of life, because that is very important. What we can understand through the senses. Uh, he's not saying that uh, we shouldn't think. He's not saying that the Greeks didn't have deep thoughts about humanity or human beings but he's saying that it's important uh, when you battle this extreme self-consciousness in uh, uh, modern life. I think that's the general idea. There's something else there too, I think, which comes a long way, goes a long way back, uh, if you want to bring in the idea of Schiller's idea of naive and sentimental poetry. It's the same kind of distinction. Uh, you know, Schiller made this distinction between naive and sentimental. Sentimental is precisely self-conscious modern poetry. Naive is Homer, uh, in that sense. Uh, a 
it's a very similar idea. Uh, I think a very similar idea you can find in Marx. Both Marx and Nietzsche call the Greeks children uh, because they find this freshness of childhood. Uh, it's the childhood of, of Western culture. And so in, 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 that, in that respect, <coughs> sorry, we have the idea of naive and sentimental and also something else, which I think is very important in Nietzsche, that perhaps goes all the way back to Winkelmann. It's the discovery of the South. Uh, Mr. Levani talked about the light in the Aegean, and he's absolutely right. It's the South. It's kind of getting rid of the guilt of the North. The North being a guilty culture, the South being a culture not of guilt, perhaps of shame, which is something different. Uh, and uh, I think that also is behind Nietzsche's idea of going to the South. I remember those wonderful words in a poem by John Keats. He talks, oh, for a beaker full of the warm South, full of the true, the blushful hypocrine. Uh, it's the warm South as a utopia for Northern Europe. It's where we will go and find our bodies. We can be naked uh, in the sun. Uh, you can find it uh, all through uh, European culture. You can find it in D.H. Lawrence. You can find it in, you know, in novelists. You can find it in poets. Uh, and I think, if we can, you know, talk about more personal things here, uh, Mr. Levanil is right. When you, uh, if you find time to sit, you know, one summer evening or afternoon on an island and you get that wonderful northeastern breeze we call Meltemi coming from the Black Sea and the atmosphere is so absolutely clear and crisp you understand exactly what Nietzsche is saying. It seems like at that moment everything becomes visible. Uh, everything is clear. Every outline is clear. Of course uh, the intense sun creates intense shadows as well. And the worst, the most heinous crimes are committed in the shadow of a very intense sun. So that would take us back to tragedy, but we can leave that for the moment. Uh, you speak about a lot about a sinful a feeling of the sinful. Mr. Livanelli spoke about erotism and these kind of things, mm -hmm. and the mystic feeling of a miscellany. So. Mr. Livanelli, do you really think that there is a, a juxtaposition between the South uh, with uh, this sense of uh, sin and uh, the North European, Nordic or Viking kind of mentality, uh, thinking that this is correct or not correct and we have to rectify that? And all this uh, today's, uh, how to say, criticism vis-a-vis these, uh, so to say, superficiality of the Greeks, uh, do you think that it stems uh, from this uh, northern approach uh, that, oh, these Greeks, uh, they are full of sins and we have to rectify them? Uh, or how can, for instance, uh, the Eastern tendency of uh, the philosophy of the approach could help the Greeks? Uh, I think um, there is no big, big, big contradiction between the erotic, mystic, or, <laughs> you know, I, but the, the most important, one of the most important thing is uh, the, your beautiful speech is the, the feeling of guilt and uh, shame. This is, uh, I, I wrote several articles years ago about this, and um, uh, as we all know, also that in Protestantism, for instance, I mean, everybody was born in a, guilty and uh, the feeling of guilt is very important but also that uh, the in, in Russian culture for instance I wrote once that there is no Raskolnikov in Turkish novel because there isn't any Raskolnikov mm -hmm. I mean when they, when they kill someone when they hide it uh, it's okay I mean no problem but when somebody sees you I mean or by stealing something talking about pen no <laughs> and the uh, and uh, uh, <laughs> so the shame, this, the feeling of shame is much greater, much bigger than the, the feeling of guilt. So then I thought, I, I know uh, Greece a little bit, and I stayed, for instance, uh, I spent one week in Mount Athos, Agion Oros, with the, with the priests. 
And even that priests were really cheerful and uh, full of light. And I didn't see anybody who feels strong guilt. <laughs> so th I think this distinction uh, between South and North is really uh, exists. There was the discussion, Mrs. Papadaki, about feeling guilty. And you w were the first one uh, to, to raise the point uh, uh, or to make the relation, to, to, to imply the relationship uh, between what Nietzsche has written and the tragedy and uh, uh, the dimension of the tragedy or as a factor in his thinking. So there, the feeling of the guilty is the prevailing one. And of course, uh, the purification, which comes uh, following what you mentioned about uh, hubris, or the offense, or the reason for transpassing certain red lines here and there. So you think that uh, this is what can happen in our days vis-a-vis -vis the modern Greeks uh, concerning this uh, hubris uh, or the offense against, uh, so to say, the established uh, Western uh, Cartesian uh, rules of life? I think that uh, the human being has touched the hybris now. <laughs> we are at this point. You understand? OK, sometimes I can speak English, sometimes I cannot speak English. No, no, go ahead. If you go so uh, the human being is in this point. He has touched the hybris. This is why I think that something has to happen. This is very important. We have overpassed the limits. The human being now, in this moment, has overpassed the limits. So you imply a kind of about deus of ex machina, in other words, uh, to get back I to I tragedy? Don't know. I don't know. You don't know? No, no, I don't know. It can be l a, a thing like, for but instance, I wait something. IMF, International Monetary Fund? I don't know. You don't know? No, but I want to say something about the Greek light. By this strong light, you can see, and I speak as a poet, you can see the invisible. Yeah. The invisible. There are times that almost you are blind from this light. So you can see the invisible. Uh, and still, I, I want to come back to this conversation about the, hu the human hybris now. Don't you see it, that we have overpassed all the limits? And for the planet, and for ourselves, and for everything. We want more and more and more and more. It's the limit up. The limit up. Uh, as for me, I wait something. Yes. I don't know what. Mr. Lanya, you see, people coming from the eastern mm -hmm. part of the continent uh, seem to, to follow their own path, uh, which is a bit uh, tricky, you know. So. Being a middle European, middle European <laughs> minded, how you, you can assess uh, the Greek behavior? I'm not speaking about the past, <coughs> but about the present. Well, I, I wouldn't, wouldn't like to touch the policy and politics, uh, but uh, from our point of view, I think uh, Greece uh, is now may, may maybe sometimes surpassing its its limits, uh, but yet we we don't know uh, whether our position in in this respect is, is the correct one because uh, we. Uh, are trying to profit from the, uh, how to say, uh, liberties which we gained in the uh, Velvet Revolution, after the Velvet Revolution, and we are behaving also uh, very uh, selfishnessly, and uh, we are not those who who could we could judge the Greek behavior in the uh, in, in in present time. So definitely, from the uh, Middle European point of view, we should be uh, very 
he should behave very uh, restrictedly and he should be constrained in uh, any uh, in judging any guilt or surpassing surpassing the limits in uh, a respect of Greece and of any other Mediterranean Mediterranean uh, state for example if uh, we mention Greece we can also mention uh, maybe Portu Portugal which is now the uh, the, the, the second country who uh, of the of, of the south of the of Europe which is in uh, which uh, got in uh, in troubles and also Italy and Spain are sometimes uh, mentioned as the countries whose way of life lead to some uh, to, to, to some uh, unconstrained behavior in uh, in the way in an uh, economical way, but yet I'm, I have to say that we are not those who should judge any the behaviors on the political way of side uh, way, way, way of the polit political way, and, uh, because we are uh, newcomers in this situation. Mr. Kapsalis, last name on the coffee. Mm -hmm. Liberty, self-consciousness, respect of the human being, uh, respect of the humanity, rules, principles. Where is the task of the poets, the modern Greek poets nowadays? Poets still are. Craft is something you get from craftsmen. Um, that's, that's the only way to get it since the world began. Um, you know, you learn the craft from other craftsmen, either by reading them or working with them. That's the only way to get things done. So uh, well that has really very little to do with our <laughs> with our with our subject. I. Uh, It makes me very self-conscious to speak about <laughs> about about the craft of poetry. Um, I can only speak with um, you know with examples, um, and I have come to the conclusion that there's really very little we can say in terms of rules or general ideas about about poetry. Uh, there'll always be a poet who will. Uh, make our general idea s sound uh, funny or defunct or just stupid. So I personally have very little to say on the subject in a general way. Uh, I can only talk about uh, the way I feel about, about poetry, but that we'll have to wait for the day after tomorrow. <laughs> um, if I can get back to the idea of, of, of clarity, what I can say, and it has to do with what I've been saying here, uh, I think my generation in Greece, sometimes I feel we've been very lucky that we have lived in paradise. Uh, it's a lost paradise by now, but uh, we can talk about it. Uh, we grew up in the 50s uh, and 60s. We're the only generation of Greeks who grew up without a war. Uh, it's very, very important. Of course, we lived those of us who had something to do with uh, left people in our family, we lived under the threat of being uh, uh, you know, persecuted by, by the Greek state. Uh, but that Greeks managed to live with. Also, we had an awful dictatorship for seven years, uh, for which I personally still feel ashamed and very angry. I think it pushed Greece back at least 20 years if not more than that. But apart from that, because you know life is difficult in all corners of the earth, uh, apart from that, my generation of Greece have lived uh, a, a modest happiness uh, as a lot of Europeans after the war have, and we should come to realize that, 
uh, lived on the very top, say, 5% of the globe. I'm talking about Western Europe, not Eastern Europe. Uh, and it's about high time we realize that, that we enjoy this form of life because we have delegated certain jobs to other people in the world. Uh, this is a kind, uh, you know better than I do, there's a kind of division of labor at this point in the world where we will do the services over here and have those idiots in China and India do the work. Uh, that seems to me to have been accepted by everyone, it's not going to work. Sooner or later, somebody's going to send the bill. And uh, in Greece, we got the bill, as you know, and now we have to pay it. And I think other countries will get the bill, including the US. Um, so I, 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 I don't know what poetry has to do in all this, probably very little. Uh, it never did. I think poetry talks to the private man. Um, it teaches us at best how we can talk with ourselves in a better way. Uh, sometimes it teaches us to tell the truth about ourselves. <coughs> and in very rare moments in history, it may uh, talk to more people and in public. That's very rare in history. And that, it's not for the poet to decide, it's for history to decide. You know, when, when you write poetry in the Soviet Union in 1938 and you're called Osip Mandelstam, what you write is very, very important. Um, when you're Nazim Kikmet and you write poetry in Turkey in the 50s, what you write it has a different kind of weight. Um, but that's not for us to decide, you know, that history decides that. It's, it's the tragedy. Uh, it's what is, what is beyond us and uh, what makes us lucky or unlucky. You know, we, uh, I was lucky to be born in Greece in 1952. Mm -hmm. I could have been born in, in Africa in the same year. I'm a lucky man. I don't know what kind of poetry I would have written there if I was born in Africa in 1952, in Ghana or Uganda. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just saying really common places, but uh, they're interesting to think about once in a while because it makes the writing of poetry and literature and everything else uh, perhaps sound not so very important and it would perhaps teach us a kind of humility, which I think we, we need. That's all. <coughs> Thank you very much. Mr. Lanyu, the last question addressed to you. So, he feels happy because he, he, he was born Greek and uh, in 1950 something. Uh, but uh, do you equally <laughs> share this kind of happiness because you were born in uh, the Czechoslovakia in the 19 something? Well, I exactly. Speaking, I was born in the protectorate Bohemia and Moravia. Ooh la la. In 1944. <laughs> <laughs> so in the in, in the last day of of the Second World War, then I may feel. Be, uh, I, don't, I don't know if I should say that I I was happy. Uh, maybe I was happy because I spent only six months of my life in the in, in the Second World War and then. The, the world changed, uh, having new, new ideas and uh, new hopes uh, in front of itself. And uh, the hopes changed very quickly after, after the coup d'etat or the Soviet Union. So uh, maybe I was not as happy as uh, Mr. Kapsalis uh, because he was born into the, uh, into the free world. I was not, but yet I think that uh, we learned many things uh, just because we lived in the oppressive regime and in the regime of, uh, of totality. And uh, that uh, uh, simultaneously with uh, the uh, 
very negative things which it left on our characters. We uh, were able to uh, profit from the uh, newly acquainted liberty after um, 1989, and we could uh, preserve the ideals, which uh, maybe the West was uh, gradually losing at the time. As it was, as it was said yesterday, it was mentioned yesterday, uh, with, a, with the capitalism and socialism, and with uh, with the West uh, losing its ideals, and the East uh, having its ideals until the uh, collapse of communism, and now gradually losing it again, and that any utopia, any any ideal. Uh, has has lost has lost its attractivity now, so uh, yet I am happy that I could live through the very short uh, rise of of the hopes in the name in the nineties, uh, but of course uh, now uh, the situation uh, changed very uh, very substantially, but of course. Uh, to, to be born in Africa and to be born in a third world <laughs> is something completely different. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you so much. <laughs> Mr. Libanelli, final point. Tell me, uh, do you really think that uh, the, this uh, uh, philosopher Nietzsche coming from Middle Europe and Middle Europe uh, was quite superficial in thinking that some other parts of this continent could be really genuinely superficial and not to see thinks uh, because of profundity, or he was meaning something else, more precisely? Uh, yeah. um, it, it's impossible to know what he meant, <laughs> but, you know, I tried to explain what I thought uh, um, about this. But if you allow me, I would like to say a few words in this last, so what, uh, uh, about what uh, my dear friend Thomas Schlane said between Turkey and Greece relations. Can I do that? Yeah, sure, please. Yeah. Go ahead. Because, you know, our identities are mixed. And um, uh, we don't have the separate Turkish identity. And what I believe that there is no separate modern Greek identity. I'm not talking about ancient uh, Greece. Because it's everything is mixed. For instance, I would like to give you some examples. The, the, the Turks came from Central Asia to uh, Anatolia. And uh, they learned, for instance, the winds. And the name of the winds, all the winds are Greek in Turkish. And uh, for instance, the, all the uh, names of the fishes and the seafood and everything is Greek, except two, uh, swordfish and shields, because Turks knew shield and <laughs> swords. <laughs> so they say swordfish and uh, uh, shield fish, <laughs> turbo. But the rest uh, is Greek. And w what I feel, for instance, the great poet Seferis was from Urla, from uh, Anatolia. And we celebrated Mikis Seldrakis' 80th uh, birthday in Çeşme, in Turkey, with a concert, great concert. I mean, this is really mixed, the food and the other. In national state period, the both sides tried to separate uh, this cultural identity which political reality is nothing, um, I mean, cultural identity is not as easy as the political identity. So that's why it st still goes on. And um, uh, we lived 500 years together. And uh, this, there is superficial, not Nietzsche <laughs> context, but for myself, it's a superficial idea is Greeks lived uh, under the Turkish dictatorship, which is not true. Uh, we all lived under a dynasty, which this dynasty was not a Turkish dynasty. This was, a, you know, a dynasty, and the uh, Turks were not yeah. higher had not higher position than Greeks. Just the other way around, Greeks had more uh, literate and had uh, they became, you know, uh, viziers, grand viziers, or uh, you know, ambassadors, and you know, higher position than Turks, but. Still, we have this kind of uh, problems for culture, which is very superficial. I went, first time I went to Greece at the year 75, 
I used to live in Sweden then in, as a political refugee because I was in military prison in 72. In 73, I escaped and became political refugee. I was really homesick, so I decided to go to uh, uh, Greece. And uh, I went all the way from Stockholm to Brindisi to Italy and took uh, Karagiorgios ferry. And that one year <laughs> after <laughs> to Patras, it was one year after the Cyprus invasion. And I was told never say, never say Turkish coffee, never mention, which is very dangerous. So I say, okay, never say Turkish coffee. <laughs> and I went to the, you know, Karagiorgios ferry, I went to the bar and I said, five coffee, please, to my friends. And, I said, and the, the waiter asked, what kind of coffee, sir? I said, Greek coffee. And he was really satisfied and shouted back, and the cafe Turkico. <laughs> five Turkish coffee. <laughs> If I say Turkish coffee, <laughs> it would be a crime. But you know, he is satisfied. And so this kind of stories, I can tell thousands of stories like this. I mean, our, uh, in a sympathetic way and sometimes a tragic way, our, our identity is you know, really we, mixed. We, we changed yeah. the name of the coffee during the junta. It was actually the junta. We, during we, the junta, yeah. Oh, yeah, we always say Turkish coffee. Yeah. That's what my mother said, that's what I said. Uh, it's used to and we still, we still use the word. <laughs> I mean, those of us who are a bit older than, say, 50, sometimes we they still say, say Turkish coffee. Sometimes they say Cafe Byzantini coffee. Oh, that's, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's, 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 uh, if I may yeah. ask for a coffee break between <laughs> ourselves, uh, in order to give the audience uh, the possibility to, to put questions. So please uh, just uh, raise your hand and uh, identify, if you wish uh, so, yourselves, and please uh, put questions, if any. You see how much convincing <laughs> you had yeah. right? No? So, it doesn't seem to be the case. So, lady, gentlemen, I am very grateful to all of you for contributing to this very, very metaphysical, controversial, ambivalent uh, Nietzsche's saying, and all the best uh, to each one of you, and uh, welcome here and enjoy the festival. Thank you so much. Thank all you. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.